en nombre de la Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo, eh, GFDD, el Festival de Cine Global Dominicano y la New York Film Academy, hoy les vamos a tener varias eh, sorpresas. Eh, lo primero es que vamos a hacer hoy formar anuncios de un acuerdo que se hizo público en el mes de enero de, entre la Fundación Global y la New York Film Academy, donde se le otorgaba un 25% de descuento. Eh, New York Film Academy no da descuento y a través de nosotros eh, logramos un acuerdo que van a otorgar ese 25%. Eso tiene que ser específicamente, eso es parte del acuerdo, tiene que ser tácitamente a través de nosotros, porque ellos tienen muchas aplicaciones. Imagínense que todo el mundo ponga, eh, yo soy dominicano, entonces le vamos a dar un 25%, y no, entonces tienen que ir eh, literalmente a través de un correo electrónico que se, que se, va, que se creó ya, donde eh, usted pedirá la información y ahí se le enviará el documento necesario. Eh, son tres convocatorias al año, solamente es un mes para aplicar y luego ellos se quedan el tiempo de evaluar, porque no obstante, aunque usted quiere estudiar, no todo el tiempo eh, hay el espacio eh, requerido. Luego de que ustedes llenen sus formularios, esos formularios serán enviados eh, donde ellos y ahí ellos tomarán la decisión y aplicarán el descuento. Muchos han preguntado que becas y otro tipo de cosas. Eh, nosotros hasta el momento vamos con el 25%, que eso les puedo decir que duramos casi dos años llegando a ese acuerdo, porque ellos no tienen ningún tipo de descuento, ni beca tampoco. Ellos tienen un tipo de beca que las asignan por persona que dan las becas, pero eso lo manejan ellos. Entonces, comenzaremos con esta parte y el objetivo es que el, la mayor parte de los dominicanos y el que pueda ir eh, pueda recibir una educación. No obstante, dentro del marco del mismo acuerdo estarán viniendo eh, un sinnúmero de profesionales eh, relacionados al cine, a la televisión, a la actuación, a todo lo que el mundo audiovisual eh, para dar estos talleres así de esta misma eh, calidad. La idea principal es que se vaya mejorando la calidad del cine en la República Dominicana y el cine no solamente son las películas que ustedes ven, o sea, para llegar a la película hay que hacer un proceso muy grande, eh, eso cuesta mucho tiempo, mucho dinero y como ustedes pueden ver dentro del de el cine dominicano hemos ido avanzando mucho, hay personas que que dicen que hacemos cine malo, no estamos haciendo cine malo, estamos haciendo cine. Si ustedes buscan la historia de cualquier nación que haya desarrollado la cinematografía, ustedes encontrarán que comenzaron con comedias, según ustedes, malas, pero no eran comedias malas, sino era un proceso de aprendizaje. Eh, República Dominicana, en este momento estamos haciendo 20, 22 películas, 15 películas, eso es mucho. Eso es mucho y es necesario hacerlo porque eh, vea una película del 2007 o del 2006 y ustedes van a ver que no es lo mismo la película ahora. La calidad técnica, hemos mejorado los guiones, ya las actuaciones no son... Hay muchos todavía actores de teatro que cruzaron al cine, no es lo mismo actuar en, en el teatro que actuar en el cine. Entonces, eso va mejorando. Eh, la calidad de las comedias también tiene un nuevo repunte. De manera que este es el objetivo principal, que ustedes aprendan durante todo el año en coordinación con la Dirección General de Cine, se imparten muchísimos talleres, eh, no, a veces ustedes no verán que en la ciudad hay talleres, es que también se están dando ese tipo de entrenamiento en los pueblos, en los pueblos hay mucho talento, en Santiago, Puerto Plata, Nagua, Higüey, ustedes no se imaginan lo que hay. Y a veces creemos que nosotros los dominicanos no nos reconocen, sí nos reconocen mucho. Hay una empresa en Canadá, específicamente en Montreal, que se dedica a la postproducción de CGI, que es lo, o sea, ahora mismo casi todas las películas son animadas, son digitales, son hechas. 
firman una pantalla verde y después hacen todo eso. Dentro de ese grupo hay dominicanos, jóvenes nuevos que trabajan con las computadoras y ya nos estamos desarrollando no solamente en la parte de las cámaras, de la, de la, de la edición, sino también en desarrollar los proyectos digitales del cine. Bueno, señores, esta noche vamos a contar con una explicación sobre los principios de la luz. Eso es la fotografía, el principio de la luz. De ahí se determina todo. Y quién mejor que David Mayer, del New York Film Academy, eh, ha tenido maestría, posgrados, relacionado todo con el mundo de la fotografía y las artes. Él ha eh, accedido hoy, él está en la terrena, fascinado, maravillado de, la, de nuestro país, y accedió a venir a apoyarnos para el lanzamiento de lo que es eh, este nuevo acuerdo con New York Film Academy. Recapitulando, en la próxima semana, en la página de Funglobe, en la página del festival, en la página de GSDD, en la página de DG Cine, estará el link donde encontrarán toda la información para llenar la solicitud y hacer su aplicación. Recuerden que son tres solamente eh, so solicitudes al año, dentro de esas tres solicitudes usted cogerá el curso, el taller son muchos cursos, son muchos talleres hay cursos eh, de corta duración hay cursos de larga duración eh, en fin, todo es en inglés eso es lo primero que ellos dicen no es que usted tiene que estar graduado de inglés pero es en inglés no hay un traductor en el camino como hoy que tenemos un traductor pero es en inglés de manera que van a través de esas tres, cuatro páginas, encontrarán un link, también saldrá en la prensa y le vamos a dar difusión masiva para que todos ustedes puedan llenar. De manera que muchas gracias por apoyarnos, sigan apoyando al cine dominicano, a los audiovisuales, a la fotografía, que lo comentaba con Dave, antes la fotografía dentro de las películas, era un profesional que llevaban a tirar fotos de las películas y el nombre de ese profesional estaba abajo. Ya con el tiempo, el nombre de profesional es director de fotografía y still photos. O sea, ya subió de nivel. ¿Por qué? Porque ya la importancia de la foto fija es relevante en todo el sentido de la palabra. Y como es digital, pues ya vamos a tener más equilibrio al, al, al mundo de la foto y de la cinematografía. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. ¿Cómo están? And that is the extent of my Spanish. Es la de mi español. Okay. Okay. So, I have a couple of goals tonight. Tengo un par de metas esta noche. I'd like to talk about light. Sobre la luz. What I call the principles of light. I'd like to talk a little bit about my work and my history, and then I would like to talk a little bit about the New York Film Academy to so give you a little more information about what we do and our method of teaching. So let's start um, with a little bit of history, how I got into the industry, what I did through my career, and I'll show you a little bit of my work. Um, I have been a photographer, a commercial photographer. Los traductores, bajen el volumen para el que no tenga traductor pueda entender eh, a David, que se, se está oyendo muy alto. Bajen los traductores. Los que bajen en español. Gracias. Ok. <laughs> So I've been in photography for 25 years. I went to the New York University for a Bachelor's of Fine Art in Photography. I then went to the School of Visual Arts in New York also for a Master's in Digital Photography. Um, and uh, I am now currently the co-chairman of the photo department at the New York Film Academy. I've been teaching there for about five years at this point. Um, and again, I've been working in commercial photography for about 25 years, and my career has sort of taken an interesting turn, at least I think it's kind of interesting. I started working in the children's market in uh, New York City, working in children's magazines, which then led me 
the magazines like Child Magazine and Parents Magazine, perhaps you know Sir Padre's Magazine, did a little bit of work for them. Um, and that also then led me into educational publishing, where you would look at, you know, you all go to school, most of us go to school at some point, and there are pictures in the books of kids working on projects or of still images that are in those books for children to look at. So I spent many years working in that industry as well. It was a great, actually a great opportunity. There was nothing really as much fun as photographing no kids in the studio because it's like a giant play date. You, know, you get to come, go to work, you play for a while, they take some pictures, you shake their hand, they go home, it's perfect. Okay. Um, so from there, after working with kids uh, and parents and babies, I moved into the adult market and started working on um, adult editorial and advertising, working in some magazines like Park Place magazine uh, and uh, little bits of advertising for small businesses. And I created a series of work that I call Main Street, which is really looking at small business owners, uh, mostly in New Jersey, because that's where I live, and what they make places where the owner is hands-on. They are there to provide a service or to make a product, something that they're very proud of. And that was really interesting for me because I found that there was so much pride in what they did as a small business owner and what they provided and what they created for uh, for their clients. Uh, it, was, it was really amazing to see, even from simple things like somebody who has a private coffee house that's not Starbucks, it's not a big, huge corporation. The way they treat people, the way they feel about their business, it's really, really incredible to see that. And it was across the board for all of these businesses, and I found it really, really inspiring and interesting to see how they interact and what that business structure is, is like. Um, so one of, I'm sorry, let me go back for a second. One of the benefits of shooting this for me is I did a bunch of restaurants, and every time the restaurant owner would make some food, and unfortunately I had to eat it all. It was really tough, you know, very difficult. But it was a really, really fun project to work on. It was mostly businesses that were local to me, so I can still go and see them. And this happened um, just before the big recession started. Uh, so it's been a little interesting also to watch as these businesses have either survived the recession or not. And some of them have closed their doors since then. I was fortunate, but part of this process for me was uh, photographing the stores and providing them prints. So they all have, you know, memories. I know they have lots of other memories, but memories from this as well. Okay, um, so out of some of the commercial work, what things that tend to happen sometimes is you will find something that you really just are interested in as a photographer. Um, so for example, I was uh, doing some work on my house and I had to open up a wall and I found this wrench just buried in the wall and it was really rusty and you know it wouldn't work or anything anymore but there's this I just looked at it and I thought this is just unbelievably beautiful just in the shape and the color and the texture that was happening on it. And so I decided, hey, you know, why not photograph? And just, you know, something so simple, right? I mean, you look at tools all the time, right? You're constantly using them. And it was such a simple idea, and I just put it on, you know, a white light box, actually, and I lit it with a flashlight. And I was like, wow, this is really kind of cool. And uh, it sort of started this whole series for me, which I call Handheld because um, I only photograph tools that you can actually use with your hands. And I started going around, to, first I asked all my buddies, I was like, hey, do you got any rusty tools that I can use? Like, what are you talking about? Why do you want rusty tools? And so I explained the process, and uh, they started handing me stuff, and you know, I started hitting up antique shops, and so I was going just to find, you know, they all have big boxes of old tools, um, just to look through and come up with uh, other ideas, other tools that I could potentially photograph. And it turned into, I'm still shooting it as I find interesting tools and stuff. I'll keep going. Uh, forgive me, I jumped ahead a little bit here. Um, but I think what you'll find as a photographer also is that, again, things that interest you on the personal side can become really interesting things to photograph. So I happen to really like old cars from like the 40s and 50s. So I go to lots of car shows, and chat up everybody that's there. And wound up just one afternoon, just starting to photograph not just the whole car, because that's what you, know, you tend to do. You're like, oh yeah, remember this car? You're going to shoot the whole thing. Right? I want to see everything, and you know, make a note of what, what year it is, what car it is. But then I started looking a little closer. And I started thinking, well, 
maybe there's like something interesting in the little parts, the close-up things, like the curves and the colors that are going on in all these hot rods. And it led into a series that I call Body Parts, um, which is kind of fun to read because without the image, you're going, whoa, what's this guy shooting now? You know, what kind of body parts are we talking about? But it's really, uh, it's just about cars and just looking at close-up things and it was kind of trying to find the abstraction and the beauty in just, like I said, the shape or like the color that's happening. And then utilizing cameras and depth of field to really come up with, you know, a great feeling to that image. These ones I wound up uh, printing quite large, about 30 by 40 inches, and mounting onto aluminum. So you sort of have this edge of metal, you know, and these are all based on, you know, this is before fiberglass, really, all these cars. So they're all made out of metal and mounted on metal. And it was, uh, it was really kind of a fun and interesting series for me to photograph, something I'm still working on as well. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I sort of made a new best friend. It's really kind of nice to make a new best friend at my age. You know, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, but he is an owner of a shooting range. And I had never shot a gun before. And so he brought me out and, uh, you know, started shooting there a little bit. And, um, it, you know, I started meeting people through the range. And it sort of led to this idea of photographing gun owners with their kind of arsenals, with the stuff that they keep at home or in their own private spaces. And it, it kind of started with this image where I met, um, I met this woman and you know, she told me that she, her, she's a, she rides in an ambulance, she's an EMT. And she said she has a partner who um, she rides with also two women. And I said, hey, let's, let's do a, you know, a photograph. Let's do something that sounds really interesting. And we couldn't put that together. And she was like, well, I still want to do it with you. I was like, well, what else do you do? And she said, well, I go trap shooting, you know, skeet shooting with my family. And I was like, oh my god, I got to photograph that. And so, you know, they invited me out, and we went out to this field, brought lights, and you know, the whole thing, and set it up. And and to me, it was like this eye-opening thing because I have always been very unclear about the gun laws in the United States and what that means. Um, and so it was really interesting for me to go ahead and sort of chat with people who are, you know vehemently pro-Second Amendment in the States, where they feel like their right to own should never be revoked and should never be even questioned. And, you know, I mean, I, honestly, I'm a liberal kind of guy. You know, I sort of question everything, right? So it was a great way to sort of have a conversation with them. And then through the gun range that I mentioned, I wound up meeting you know, a bunch of other people who I was able to sort of talk with a little bit ahead of time and go into their homes and really sort of by telling them, you know, talking about allowing them to voice their thoughts and their opinions in this series, um, you know, I could get in there and photograph them and their families and their weapons. I, you know, I, I don't know how you guys feel about gun owning, right? But some of the stuff I walked into and was terrified, okay? Um, and you know, really nice, really intelligent, very articulate people for the most part. But it still, you know, get, takes you back a minute and go, okay, do I want to live next to this guy? Maybe, maybe not, I don't really know. Um, this one I, I love actually because of what's happening here, right? Because that's kind of the exact opposite of what you would expect an Obama fan to be sort of a conservative gun owner. So I thought it was a really great juxtaposition about, you know, the information that's going on in there and the fact that her son is part of the whole process. So, you know, it's like my best, one of my other best friend's wife's, you know. Okay, so why am I showing you this work? Like, what's important about looking at photography and looking at and understanding how people work and what their process is? And the answer for me is, is pretty simple, is that so that you can see and understand light. Because the truth is, without light, there is no such thing as photography. There is no such thing as cinematography, right? It just can't happen without light. Light is what drives all imagery that we see and record. There's no other way about it, right? So why is that important? Well, if we can understand really how light works, we can then control it. 
We can make decisions that allow us to create what we see here in our images. Because that, to me, is really the ultimate goal, right? I want to take what I have pre-visualized in my head and turn it into a photograph, right? So how do we do that? Something that we kind of see and know already before even studying it, because you see light every day, and you see how it interacts with the subjects around you. But if we take a slightly more scientific look at it, and we can really sort of nail down and talk about what light does and how it interacts, we can then, as I said before, find a way to really control it and to utilize it. So um, this is stuff that, like I said, we all know. And for years, while I was shooting, I wasn't really thinking about it, right? I was just doing it, right? So I learned in school, and then I learned when I was starting out in the field. But when I started, actually, when I found this book and read it, it all sort of made sense. So a lot of what I'm talking about now comes from this book. So I need to sort of give credit where credit is due. Um, it's a great book. It's called Light, Science, and Magic. Um, it's by Phil Hunter, Stephen Biver, and uh, Paul Figoa. It's fantastic. It's a really easy read. Um, and it just allows you to really understand light very, very well. OK, so let's talk about the principles of light. Again, if we understand the science behind the light, we can understand how light really works. So what's the goal? Again, understanding allows us to be creative. If we know what the light is doing and how it's going to interact, we can then be very creative. It's a great quote from the book called, Lighting is the Language of Photography. And again, it allows you to pre-visualize and create images that match what you see in your head. And the ability to do that comes with understanding how light works. OK, so here's the principles. The first one is size. What does that mean, really? Well. Large light sources and small light sources make a very different interaction with the subject. It really determines the quality of the shadows. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about light, is light and shadow. What do we see? So a small light source is what's called a hard light. Now, some of you guys who've studied cinematography probably know this terminology. Maybe not in English. You know what I'm talking about, right? A small light source makes a hard light, and the definition of a hard light is that the transition between light and shadow is very abrupt. And here's a really great example of it by a photographer named Greg Gorman. Again, credit where credit is due. You see what's happening in the shadow here. There is a very, very clear distinction between where that light ends and where the shadow starts. And that's considered a hard light. And this comes from a very small source. Okay? It's really quite simple. And this is the single most important factor in determining how to light your subjects. Again, whether it's for photography or cinematography. Because that hard line, that hard light, really adds a huge dimension of mood, sensuality. Um, it, it's a completely different way of doing something than for example, a large light source. So if you can imagine a large light or a small light source makes a hard light, a large light source makes a soft light. Okay? And the definition, again, is that the transition between light and shadow is very visual. You can't really see where the light stops and the shadow starts. And also makes a very, very different feel. Oops, sorry. Let me go backwards. Too many clicks. Sorry about that. We'll stay there for a second. Um, this is by a photographer named Dan Winters. And you can see it's, it's very hard to even tell where your shadow starts. It's almost not even there. Very soft light. OK? All right, so how do we make a hard light soft? How do you make the difference? Well, you can make it larger, or you can add what's called diffusion material. Well, let's talk about that. What is that main light source that we know about, that we see every day when we go outside? It's the sun, right? 
That's a pretty easy, easy question, right? It's the sun. So let's look at the sun for a second. There's our happy sun, okay? And what kind of light source do you suppose the sun would be? Anyone, take a guess. You got two choices. Natural, okay, it's natural light, yes, but will it be hard or soft? Hard, why hard? Why hard? I mean, you're right, it is a hard light source sometimes, not always. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes, everyone, you too, no cheating. Close your eyes. You're going outside, it is a bright, sunny day. You're standing on the street. What does your shadow look like? Can you see it? Absolutely. Is it hard or soft? It's very hard, right? There's nothing in front of the sun. But we're going, well, wait a minute. The sun is like 60 million miles big, or something like that. It's huge, right? It's enormous. But size is relative to the distance from the subject. So the sun is also millions and millions of miles away. It is this tiny source, absolutely tiny. It makes an incredibly hard light when, you know, only in certain circumstances, okay? So the sun shines directly down, bright sunny day, nothing in front of it. You can see the shadow that it makes. Great example of a very hard shadow. These images, by the way, are from that book. Again, credit where credit is due. So how do we make the sun into a soft light? What has to happen? Perfect. Who said that? Gold star, nice job, all right? So yes, clouds. As soon as clouds come in front of the sun, in between the sun and the subject, which is us, or earth, or trees, or whatever it is that we're looking at, something very interesting happens. The clouds act as what's called diffusion material, okay? The sun goes into the clouds in one direction, but because there's all this stuff in the clouds, like moisture and things, the light starts moving in all sorts of directions, and it comes out of the cloud in many, many directions. And what it does then, instead of making that hard shadow, is it makes a very soft shadow, because the sun is essentially filling in the shadows as well. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. Large light, soft light. Small light source, hard light. Right? And we're talking about the way the shadows look. In this image, you can hardly see where the light stops and the shadow starts. Really interesting thing to note, though, if you look closely at the base, the deepest part of what we call the D-max of the shadow, it is going to be almost identical to that of a hard shadow. So the density of the shadow doesn't really change so much. It's just with a transition. OK, that's principle number one. We good? Everybody got it? All right, let's move on. Just a couple more examples. Uh, Martin Scholler, great photographer. Greg Gorman again, another example of hard light. All right, so let's move on to the next principle. Sorry. All right, lighting is a relationship between the viewer light and the subject. It's an interesting thing to think about. Relationship between the viewer, the light, and the subject. Well, what does the subject have to do with that? I mean, I understand the viewer and the light, right? That makes sense. The camera and the light, they have this interaction together, right? But how does the viewer come into play? I'm sorry, the subject come into play? So, again, it's easy to realize that there are two of them. But let's talk about the third one. OK, subjects and light. Every subject interacts and emits light in different ways. And this has a lot to do with the way that we actually see light and how we can record it. So let's talk about those different interactions. So the first one is transmission. Light can transmit through an object, something like glass or air. Right? And if it's going at a 90 degree angle, or if it's perpendicular to that subject, it will pass straight through. And you almost can't see it. Right? You know this just by looking out the window. Right? You look out the window, you don't see any reflections in the window. The light is transmitting through it. Okay? 
The second one is absorption. Again, you're outside on that bright, sunny day, and you're wearing a black shirt. What happens? You get hot instantly, and you start sweating, right, instantly. Why is that? It's absorbing the light, right? It's absorbing the light, and the light is actually, that light energy is turning into heat energy. You don't see it as light anymore, okay? And that's why black objects tend to absorb a lot more light. They're much harder to light for photography or for cinematography. It's a little more challenging. You have to treat them slightly differently. The third way that the subjects interact is reflection. And that's really how we see objects, is how light reflects off of the subject. All right, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about reflection. So lighting, for me, is really reflection management. And that sort of brings us right into the second principle. If you can handle and control the way the reflections happen off of your subject, you can make any image you want. So we're gonna talk about, there are three types of reflection. We're really just gonna talk about two of them. The first one is diffuse reflection, the second one is direct reflection. The third type of reflection is polarized direct reflection, also known as a glare. You guys have all seen it when something is, um, the sun is bouncing off the water and it sort of looks dimmer than the light actually should be. Again, we'll hold off on that one. I want to talk mostly about diffuse and direct reflection. So diffuse reflection, what does that mean? Well, the subject emits light in all directions. Just like the sun coming through the clouds, the light is sort of spread out in multiple directions. When the subject hits, a, uh, sorry, when the light hits a subject that emits mostly diffuse reflection, it tends to bounce around and all over the place. Okay, so, so what? Why is that important to know? Well, it allows you to see the light with the same intensity no matter where you are as the viewer. So I could stand here or I could stand there. If I'm looking at a subject that emits mostly diffuse reflection, it's going to appear the same. And you also know this intuitively. You have seen this happen. When you look at a white wall or a white shirt or um, something that is a lighter color and you move around the room, it doesn't change. It emits the same amount of light. Okay, that's really helpful to know. A couple of examples of diffuse reflection. It's a little bit more of my work. Um, I did throw my name in there just to be fair with the other photographers whose names are showing up too. Okay. All right. So anywhere you were looking at her, the light would appear to be the same, unless you went all the way to the side, right, and then you were actually seeing uh, some shadow play. All right, a couple more examples of diffuse reflection. That's Dan Winters. Uh, and this is me again. All right, so that brings us to law number one. So unfortunately, there are a couple of laws when it comes to lighting, okay? The first law is called the inverse square law. Well, so what does that mean? What's that? Okay, <laughs> good, got the thumbs up. All right, so the inverse square law. The law says that intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. What? What does that mean? That's not so helpful. It really means when you move the light closer, it gets brighter. It's that simple. There is a mathematical equation you can use, but I have never ever seen a photographer take out their calculator and do the math and figure out how much to move the light. You just know this, right? You sit at your desk, you're doing work, and it's not bright enough, it's too dark, what do you do? You take the desk lamp and you move it closer. Simple, inverse square law, right? If it's too bright, you move it farther away, okay? Very, very simple concept, all right? Uh, but really important to know. Now, this law also really only pertains to diffuse reflection. It doesn't really have very much to do with direct reflection at all. We'll talk about why in a minute. Okay, so on to direct reflection. Direct reflection is a mirror image of the light source. 
it's equal in brightness to the source. And sometimes it's also called specular reflections. All right, so why do we need to know about that? Well, here's an example right here and here and here and here of direct reflection. We are seeing the source. We are seeing the sun. And everybody knows this. Close your eyes again. Everybody close your eyes. All right, you're looking in the mirror, and there is a light behind you. What do you see in the mirror? The light. Well, you see yourself, too, of course, right? Because you're looking in the mirror. But you see the light source. It is as bright as the light is itself, if you were to turn around and just look at the light. What? How does that work? It's a direct reflection. There is nothing diffuse about that. It is not spreading all over the place. It is in one single direction. Okay. Now, what we should understand, and this is an important thing to understand, is that all subjects emit certain amounts of both types of reflection, Okay. which is why when the car you don't see direct reflection anywhere else except for these little spots over here. Okay, so it emits both types of reflection. Um, so how does it work? Well, I just sort of said that. Uh, it's really you see direct reflection on smooth and shiny objects. We talked about mirrors, metal, glass, things like that, and even sometimes on tomatoes. Okay, here's an example of direct reflection that happens. Right, there's a shine to that to the skin of the tomato. Um, and you can see this is sort of mirroring the light. All right? So, um, with direct reflection, the light's reflected off the subject in the same exact angle that it comes in. And this is the important part to understand about direct reflection. Um, so, in other words, the way it comes in is the way it will go out. And let's kind of look at a, a second law and look at an example of that. The second law of light is called the angle of incidence. So again, here's an example. Here's our happy sun. The light comes in. We're hitting a mirror or a shiny object here, and the light bounces out at the exact opposite angle that it comes in. OK, so again, why is that important to know? Well, what happens is, based on where the viewer is, will determine whether you see that direct reflection or not. So if my camera or the viewer is over here, you will not see it. You will still not see the direct reflection. You have to be inside this angle in order to see that direct reflection. And that brings us to the next, um, sorry, to the next principle, which is the family of angles. The viewer can only see that direct reflection when you're placed within a certain family or group of angles. For example, here's our light. Okay. Well, here's our viewer. Here's that the shiny object down here. The viewer creates a certain angle which bounces out at the exact opposite angle. If we were to add a light source here, we would not see that direct reflection. If we add a light source here, we do see that direct reflection. We are inside of that family of angles. And now you're still going, OK, Dave, well, why does this matter? Right? Well, it matters so you can control and know where to place your lights based on your subject. So if you're photographing a person with glasses on, right, and you don't want to see that big shiny hit of light, what do you have to do? You need to place the light outside the family of angles change the subject so it's on a different angle so you're not getting direct reflection, or move your camera, change the viewer. It's that relationship, light, subject, and viewer. Okay. Here's a couple of examples of direct reflection. Over here and here, we are actually seeing the light source. And what's really kind of nice to think about, in the catch light, that little light that's in somebody's eye, that is a direct reflection. Okay. Sorry, didn't put her name up. Jenny Risher. OK, so changing the size of the light. How does that affect direct reflection? Well, we talked about how size of light 
makes a difference for that first principle, right? Whether it's hard or soft. Will it make a difference with direct reflection? What do you think? Anyone? Take a guess. There's two choices. Yes or no? Don't be shy. OK, how will it make a difference? We've got a yes over here. Is there any no's? Anybody disagree? All right, I'll go with you. Yes. <laughs> will it make a difference? It will in certain ways, right? If we increase the size of the light, basically what we're doing is increasing that family of angles. So we may be able to fill an entire subject with direct reflection. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So the direct reflection will stay there, but the, you will see more of it. The subject is what determines whether you're going to see direct reflection in the first place or not, not the light source. So hard or soft light makes no difference when it comes to direct reflection, none whatsoever. It's the subject that makes that determination. All right? OK. So earlier I said lighting is a relationship between the viewer, the light, and the subject. I don't want to change that a little bit. I want to really say that photography is a relationship between the viewer, the light, and the subject. And what, is that, what does that mean? Why do I want to change that statement? Well, I think it's because once you understand, really understand the way light works and how you can control it, how you can modify it with uh, different types of light, or even modify the sun with different elements or la layers of diffusion or scrims. You can truly create what you are seeing here, which again to me is the ultimate goal of making any type of imagery, to help you to tell the story that you want to tell with your images. Without understanding that, you're kind of, you know, no pun intended, but shooting in the dark, right? Not knowing what it is that you're going to create, how your light is going to interact with the subject. It's an important, important idea. OK, so I thought maybe we'd take a quick look at some other photographers, some other work. Uh, these images are by Merton Marcus, a fantastic fashion photography team. They are brilliant with the way they light. Um, and hopefully you can sort of see that from here. They often use very hard light sources uh, to create really incredible stuff. They use an amazing uh, color palette. I, I'm really, really impressed with their work. Another person who's, I think, a brilliant, just sort of a lighting genius is Gregory Crudson. Um, his still imagery is built as if it's a cinematography set, it's a movie set. They're gigantic sets. They'll either build whole houses and rooms and use full lighting trucks worth of gear um, or, you know, find actual locations. And it's, you know, incredibly beautiful and incredibly moving stuff. And just his control of light is unreal. I mean, and clearly storyboards everything out, sees it all here before he even approaches an idea, goes out and scouts the location or builds it, and then creates just an incredible light to tell the story. Because that's the other goal, right? Every image tells a story. And lighting allows you to enhance that story, to really help that story come out of the image. So again, this is Gregory Crudson. Dan Winters is another photographer who I think his light is absolutely incredible and also very direct in telling a story. Does a lot of celebrity. Um, again, oftentimes uses a very nice, very beautiful, very effective hard light for most of his images. OK, and um, another photographer, Martin Schuller, we saw one of his images before, has a very particular light setup for these portraits, which I find a little bit eerie, but really interesting. Because when you look close at the eyes, you can sort of tell what he's doing with lighting. And it's very, very soft light, very close, creates kind of this cat-like look in, uh, in the pupil. Um, and he shoots a lot of this with large format cameras. Really effective, really just sort of great way of looking at, uh, at the face at a, at a portrait. Okay, 
I want to move on and talk a little bit about the New York Film Academy. Um, so what does the New York Film Academy really offer and how do we structure our programs? The photography department and the photography program there is really based on a couple of principles, kind of similar to light really. Um, it's hands-on, it's very intense, and you are working with sort of the latest equipment available. So it's really an opportunity, especially at our New York campus, to explore what New York City has to offer, to work in studio, on location, and from the minute you start, you are producing images. All of our instructors are working photographers, um, so you get inside knowledge as to how the photography industry really is working in the city. Um, and we just sort of do it all in this fantastic backdrop of New York City. I thought I'd take a minute also and show you uh, a video of one of the location shoots that we're taking one of our classes to. So if we could kill the lights so these guys can see it, please. Hi guys, we're here at the Andes Hotel today. The second semester of photography students from NYFA. They're here to photograph the staff of the bar downstairs to create an outstanding brand new package for the bar. Let's go inside and see how they're doing. Come on. We have a bunch of different teams here, you know, we're shooting about 12 people, uh, got great lighting, we got this great atmosphere, you know, and it's, it's pretty cool. I'm excited. So, you know, we're like a hidden place. When you're working on Fifth, you would never have an idea that we're here. So that's what I thought for, uh, for the pictures, very 20s prohibition, when alcohol really wasn't allowed, because that's the feel that people get when they come into the bar. They walk in and they're like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Learn loud because we try different, you know, the location poetry, location fashion, everything mixed together. The work is very good, you know, everyone got a chance to take a picture. This Yeah. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what the students come up with today. I think it's presenting them a really great uh, opportunity to really stretch their wings, put themselves in a real world situation. So I'm excited to see what they do today. With it. How to work in location, which is totally different from to work in studio, and also have to meet someone and have to start working right away because you don't get to do that every single day. And once we get out of the school, it's gonna be pretty much the work. So it's a lot to learn. Best sidecar of my life. <laughs> so that's the feel that I wanted for, for the pictures. And I want it to be glamorous and I want it to be amazing and chic, but still not, not uptight and not like unreachable. Because we are reachable, we are people in the end of all. So I wanted to combine this two kind of merge, these two ideas of 
the chic, cool, trendy, fashionable side of us with the human part and the service part. We're doing all of this for, for you guys. We're doing all of this for, for our customers, really, and uh, I really hope they like it. So. All right, so that was this great opportunity. Um, I was approached by um, Gerardo, who was speaking as well. He works for the hotel. He said, hey, you know, I'm looking for photographers to come and do this for free. And I said, well, I don't really want to send students to do it for free, but if I could turn it into a class, you know, maybe it'd be great to come and photograph for you. So it was this opportunity to take students into the real world live shooting situation and have them think through the process. And, with some little bit of guidance, to be honest, um, but to put themselves out there to really sort of experience what an actual shoot. And these are the kinds of things that we try to put together uh, through the New York Film Academy for the photography students on a regular basis. So um, that kind of wraps up everything I wanted to talk about. I'd love to hear from you guys if you have questions about either the principles of light or my work or the New York Film Academy. You know, open to talking about all of that stuff. So thank you.